Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy se seminar. I'd like to first introduce uh, Michael Master Andrea, who's going to introduce our speaker today. Michael is the director of research at the program on climate change and uh, energy at the Woods Institute for the Environment, and at the same time, the director of policy in the accelerator uh, uh, part of the new Durer School of Sustainability. So. Michael, uh, please well, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Michael to introduce Hunt Alcott. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. So yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Hunt Alcott, who is a professor of environmental social science here at Stanford. He's the co-director of the Stanford Environmental and Energy Policy Analysis Center, research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, an affiliate of Ideas 42 and Poverty Action Lab. Board of the editors of the American Economic Journal of Economic Policy. And so he will be presenting today on the highlights from two papers studying the IRA EV tax credits using economic modeling and vehicle data. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, it's great fun to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about as was just said, a couple of papers which are joined with some great co-authors, uh, Rainer Kane from Chicago, Hyaksu Kwan, uh, who's a professor at Chicago, Max, uh, who's a PhD student in Chicago, Joe is a professor at Berkeley, Tess, who's a PhD student here at Stanford, and Felix, who's now at Duke, actually. Um, so let me give you a high level of the kind of work that our group does. Um, I run something called the Stanford Environmental and Energy Policy Analysis Center. And our goal is to do research to improve the efficiency and equity of uh, environmental policy, mostly in the US. Um, our outputs uh, are research papers and also dissemination through policy briefings and uh, media outlets, things like that. So in the, the paper I'll start with today was in the New York Times a couple, of, was uh, covered in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago and is under submission to uh, one of these journals. So, uh, the kinds of questions we're interested in uh, include things like how can electricity markets be redesigned to accommodate renewables and batteries? How can electric utilities make more make demand more flexible? And how well is the Inflation Reduction Act working? And with that, let me dive into the first part of the IRA uh, that is most natural to study, which is electric vehicles. Most natural to study because the vehicle market data become available much faster than data from other markets. And so we actually have some early sense of uh, what's going on. So <clears throat> what's the, the big picture of what's going on? Um, this is from the Bloomberg NEF um, forecasts, and it is a uh, projection of the share of electric vehicles in the passenger market, passenger vehicle market uh, over the next 15 years or so. So we're right about right here. The global average is a couple of percent, and under the baseline policies they project, we're going to be up by globally over 40% um, within 15 years of, of new car sales. So what's driving that is a series of policies in the U.S. and in other countries, um, and the goal here of these papers is to evaluate the efficiency and equity of these, um, of these policies. So, the EV tax credits and the Inflation Reduction Act are projected uh, by one recent paper to result in $390 billion uh, of spending over 10 years. There are, this is, um, there are different ratings of different provisions of the IRA that are most under political risk. The EV tax credits uh, in the ratings that I've seen rate highly uh, for political risk. And so this is, you know, one reason why um, evaluation is useful is that we can sort of speak to the benefits and costs of provisions that then policymakers, folks in Congress are thinking about uh, modifying. So there are two novel features. We've had um, tax credits for clean vehicles for a long time. There are two novel features to what uh, the policy designed it through the IRA that some of you may know, but I just want to highlight them. The first, of course, is industrial policy through the trade restrictions in the new EV tax credits. And the second is that we now have tax credits for purchasing used electric vehicles, which were intended to benefit uh, used vehicle buyers who are on average lower income than the new vehicle buyers. And so today, what I wanna talk through with you know, whatever time we have and have lots of discussion with you 
There are going to be two papers that we're working on in these spaces. One is on the new vehicle credits, and the second is on the uh, used vehicle tax credits. Um, so with that big picture overview, let me dive into uh, our work on the new electric vehicle tax credits. Um, what I'm going to do, so what this paper does is we present some descriptive facts on basically market trends, and in particular, the difference in uh, externalities across different vehicles. And when we did this calculation, this totally, this parts of this I knew and parts of this I didn't know. And so I think some of this is going to be especially interesting for folks in this room. So we'll start with descriptive facts on externalities uh, generated by different uh, vehicles. Then we'll show you some event study analyses, basically what happened to vehicle markets after the IRA was passed. And third, we'll present what, uh, what economists call structural models, basically a discrete choice model that allows us to simulate what the market would look like with or without the IRA and with different modifications to the IRA um, tax credits. So that's the setup of the analysis that we're going to do. And this is a fairly standard setup for economic evaluations uh, of uh, clean energy policies or any kind of policy. Um, so just for a little more detail on what these clean vehicle credits are, these are, of course, non-refundable. As many of you know, these are non-refundable income tax credits of up to $7,500 uh, for new plug-in EVs under 14,000 pounds. So basically any passenger vehicle that you, you would buy. Um, is under that weight limit. Um, it's available to buyers on personal income taxes or to lessors on corporate taxes. Um, and uh, as I was alluding to a moment ago, the IRA introduces new eligibility restrictions. So buyers have to be, uh, they can't be too rich. The vehicles have to be assembled in North America and the battery minerals and components have to be from the US or free trade agreement countries. Broad, there's some specific details, but at a high level, uh, it has to be assembled in the U.S., and the, the batteries have to be from friendly countries. And um, as of January uh, 2023, there are leasing credits. So in addition to um, the, the what are called the Section 30D credits that you could get for, for buying uh, or leasing cars that satisfy these restrictions, the IRA in also introduced a loophole, which is basically that any automaker could lease vehicles regardless of where they were from or the buyer income, and the lessor could claim tax credits for that leasing. And so we're going to come back to this in a little bit, but this is what's called what people often call the leasing loophole, because the lessor could claim tax credits uh, even for vehicles that were not assembled in North America and even for selling vehicles to rich folks. So a key part of the work that we do is getting, uh, is getting oftentimes data that are crucial to the question, but were hard to get. And part of what I'm going to show you today is um, indeed data that we developed through a research partnership with a company called Cox, uh, C-O-X, that runs the computer systems for dealerships. So like when you go buy a car, the sales person at the dealership sits down and puts in the price that you paid and like the lease terms if you're leasing the car. And there's a company that makes that computer system. And it turns out that they take all the data and they have a consulting business that they run on top of that that's like market intelligence. And so we have a partnership with them and they've actually given us the transaction level data from all the dealerships they work with, which is I think a little bit short of half of the new vehicle transactions in the country and many of the used uh, vehicle uh, dealership transactions as well. So this is going to be a, a great source of data because um, the vehicle registration data, like the quantities registered, are very commonly available, but the prices paid especially for leases are hard to come by, and that's an important part of the, of the story as to what's been happening with the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so on top of that price data, we also have um, registration microdata from the two big states, and then nationwide vehicle registration counts, which we bought from a standard source. Um, we also have uh, second choice, what economists call second choice data, which is super useful for the discrete choice modeling that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, a second choice survey is basically, they send, this is like, it's a great company. So they send uh, questionnaires to people after they buy new cars. Many of you may have received such a questionnaire after you bought a car recently, you got a five or 10% response rate. And one of the questions they asked was, imagine the car you bought weren't available, what would you have bought instead? 
So, you know, some people say, I bought a Tesla. If that car was not available, I would have bought a Rivian. Or maybe they say, if that car wasn't available, I would have bought a Honda Accord. That second choice data, it turns out, is very useful in calibrating the substitution patterns. Because we're going to want to know, like, if the IRA hadn't subsidized electric vehicles, um, what would people have bought instead of buying the newly subsidized electric vehicles? And if a lot of people say, I bought a Tesla and I would have bought a Rivian instead, that says that there's a lot of concentration and preferences for electric vehicles. If people say, I bought a Tesla and I would have bought a gas-powered Honda Accord instead, that says that people are much more willing to substitute between EVs and gas cars. And so this second choice data is actually crucial for having a realistic picture of what the market would look like under different, uh, different policies. So this is also data that is not publicly available that we have through a, a partnership between our group and uh, the company that collects it. Okay, so let me start to tell you the part of this that I think Part of it was not surprising, but part of it was quite uh, interesting and surprising to me. So I'm gonna talk about calculating the lifetime externalities from different vehicles. So what we wanna do is, as we shift people from buying gas cars to buying uh, electric cars, we wanna know how much, that, how much that's gonna improve the environment, how much, uh, basic, and, and, a, and a broader sense, how much that's gonna reduce the externalities that we impose when we drive cars, okay? so. We, what we really want to do is put dollar numbers on those things, not just like units of CO2, tons of CO2, but we actually want to put a dollar number on the benefits so that we can weigh the externality benefits in dollar units against changes in you know, consumer well-being and corporate profits and government revenues and things like that. So we want a dollar number for the lifetime externalities of driving each different uh, potential new car that you could buy in the market. So that's the goal of this calculation. Um, we make some assumptions, uh, including the newly updated social cost of carbon, $241 a ton. And we're gonna compute four different externalities um, for each vehicle over its lifetime. The first is the CO2 from manufacturing the vehicle, which is uh, as calc we're taking that number just straight out of the EPA. Uh, an EPA calculation, which Kelly et al. Some of you may do these calculations more than I do, so you may recognize this paper. Then um, we'll do our own calculations uh, following some others on the next three. The first is uh, driving CO2 and local air pollution. So of course, when I drive a gas car, pollutants come out the tailpipe. When I drive an electric car, I need to charge it. Pollution, pollutants come out of power plants to do that charging. So we want um, the emissions rates for driving a vehicle over its lifetime, and then we'll monetize that using social cost of carbon, social cost of peat, et cetera. The third externality is excess weight. So if I drive a heavier car and I get in an accident, I have a higher chance of killing somebody. And that is a really unfortunate consequence um, of us driving cars in general. And the, again, the heavier my car is, the more likely I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna kill somebody if we get in an accident. Uh, and then the final thing we're gonna calculate is uh, what I'm loosely calling fiscal externalities. But when I, um, when I, um, when I buy gas from my gas car, I'm paying a gas tax, and that's actually a benefit to the government budget. Similarly, when I charge my electric car with electricity, there's a huge markup in California and smaller markups in many other states on the electricity we buy. And so the more we charge our electric vehicles, actually the more we're benefiting rate, other rate payers of our utility because we're basically contributing to the fixed cost recovery that the utility has. Basically, in California, it's a lot of that is some um, fire prevention, uh, but there's a lot of other things. Okay, so what are the numbers that you get when you use kind of the standard accounting here? And first for the average electric vehicle and the average gas vehicle. Um, the y-axis here is averaging across all, all models of cars waiting by the market share. So there's basically the average car that's sold. EVs on the left, gasoline vehicles on the right the lifetime <laughs> externality imposed. This, uh, the electric vehicle one subs to, subs to uh, I think it's $16,000 if I'm remembering correctly, um, 15 to $16,000 where that black diamond is. That's the sum of these four different components we discussed. So that means when you buy an electric vehicle by these standard calculations, 
you're imposing $15,000 of harms on, on other people. For gas vehicles, that number's higher, and that's why we want to move people from gas to electric. For gas vehicles, that number I do remember is $19,200 by the standard calculations. And so just to review the components, green is driving CO2. That's the big thing. That's the biggest thing for gas vehicles. This is you know, on the order of $10,000 of mon at the social cost of carbon, $10,000 of monetized CO2 harm. For electric vehicles, the CO2 harm is not quite, is considerably smaller, but certainly not zero. And that just means that when I charge my car, uh, we got to run fossil power plants and they're emitting CO2. Um, so this is like the one, the, this green is the main reason why we intuit that we want to shift people from gas to electric. There are some things that work against that. In particular, this gray is the weight, excess weight in accidents. EVs weigh more than gas vehicles. So when you get in accidents, uh, you're more likely to kill somebody. So the average EV is imposing more, uh, more harm than the average EV. And then this is also adding in, in purple, manufacturing CO2 and uh, taking off the positive, what I call fiscal externality. So this is the calculation for the average car. I'm gonna show you some more stuff in a second, but let me pause, because this is, I wanna make sure this slide is clear. And you had a question. Yeah, well, it's about this. So could you say again about the, the local pollutants? I'm confused about the larger area for the EVs in local pollutants. Did I miss what that means? Yeah, so new gas cars, are just the tailpipe emission standards are increasingly tight. And so a new gas car just like doesn't emit much, certainly doesn't emit much PM, not much NOx, et cetera. And so the emission rates are, the emission rates are small. Whereas charging, whereas over here, again, we're charging a car, we are running gas or coal fired power plants and sort of the standard emission factors that we get the marginal emission factors from, from more use of the grid is adding up to that higher number. Yeah. Yeah. Let me go back to um, the previous page, but any behavioral differences in terms of driving patterns between the two um, types of vehicles? Yeah, so you can get different numbers for the average miles driven for EVs versus gas cars and the we did not think it was appropriate in this case to use the average miles driven for our particular policy question. Because our policy question is, take somebody and shift them from buying a gas car to buying an electric car due to you know, subsidizing electric car. I my sense was the right way to think about that was somebody was gonna drive whatever, 12,000 miles a year in that gas car and those are now shifted over to the electric car. So we're going to shift over all the driving that that person would have done. We want to hold mileage constant under that logic. Yeah. Was there any other questions on this slide? Yeah. Uh, just just to clarify, so the the red positive externalities is is negative because it's offsetting the negative externalities. Yeah. Sorry. These are lifetime negative externalities, and so a positive externality is going to be a negative negative externality. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Yeah. I, these are all national aggregates in terms of emissions factors for electricity, for instance, and where you're not looking at where EVs are being actually bought, like statewide, for instance, um, and charged versus where electricity has different emissions factors, right? We were indeed, we are weighting by the where the average electric vehicle currently is. So um, just as an example, uh, and it matters a lot, well, it matters a lot for various of these. So California has a relatively clean grid and its marginal emission rate is relatively low and also really high elect, uh, electricity markups for, for residential electricity. Um, and we are waiting towards those numbers because we are saying that of the marginal vehicles that are sold under a policy, we're gonna assume that those are also going to California in proportion to where they currently are. Yeah, that's our assumption there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So manufacturing CO two. How you count the car manufactured outside the United States? I'm going to defer you to Kelly et al. on that, but I'm pretty sure that this is global emissions from the manufacturer, like the full supply chain, regardless of where it is. Sorry that I don't remember that from this paper. Yeah. There's one other subtlety which nobody has asked, and it's not at all a subtlety. Um, 
which is, are we using the long run or short run marginal emission rates from the electric power grid? Um, it is clear that we want the marginal emission rate in the sense of, as opposed to the current grid average emission rate. Like, it doesn't matter what the average kilowatt hour results in right now. What the, the conceptually the question we're asking is, as we subsidize EVs and put you know a thousand more EVs on the road or ten thousand more EVs on the road, that is going to cause an increase in emissions over their lifetimes. Uh, so it's marginal in that sense, but what you really want is over the lifetimes of the vehicles that are induced to be purchased, what are the uh, incremental emissions that are caused over that you know, 10 or 15 or even 20 year period? The way the decision we made for at least this version of the paper is that we are using short run marginal emission rates. So these are calculated by in a paper by Holland et al, where basically the idea is, um, as demand increases in certain regions, how much do emissions increase? So like demand increases, the total electric, the total electricity production in an ISO has to increase, and that's gonna result in more emissions. So that's what, that's what I mean by short run marginal emission rates calculated by an econometric estimate. It turns out that short run marginal emission rates have not changed over the last decade. So even as the grid has become cleaner on average, the marginal plant is still a gas plant. Like if we have to charge more, it's typically a gas, sorry, if we have to use more electricity, it's typically a gas plant that's turning on. Another way that we could have done this instead of looking at observed data and econometric estimates is to have um, some sort of capacity expansion model that, that says like, that is basically an optimization model of, well, if we introduce more EVs on the grid, what would optimally be placed to like, to generate that additional power? The, cost, the benefit of that is that that's conceptually right in the sense of being a long run emission rate, but is much less tied to data. And you might worry that what the, the sort of modeled marginal source of electricity is not actually what we'll see over the next 10 years could be because of differences in policies under different administrations or difficulties in building more renewables relative to what the capacity expansion model would say, et cetera. And so, this is an important choice that, that we made here that impacts some of these numbers. Okay, so with that, let me tell you the part of this that, this part didn't surprise me. Let me tell you the part that I thought was more substantively interesting. So now, instead of just showing you the average for EVs and GVs, let me show you the distribution across the different models. I've got Honda Accords and Rivians and, and the Hummer and all these different cars. Let me show you the distribution of these externalities across the different models. <clears throat> um, this is a histogram. So we got share on the y-axis. Now the total negative externality is on the x-axis. So vehicles over here are really dirty, basically heavy vehicles that kill a lot of people in accidents and also, and also like are gas guzzlers or electricity guzzlers. That's over here. The small, clean vehicles are over there. Red is electric, gray is gasoline. So I'm superimposing two histograms. What do you see here? Well, again, the average is electricity is more, electric EVs are more clean than the gas vehicles. So the averages are what I showed you on the previous page. There's a huge amount of dispersion and a huge amount of overlap. And let me just give you one concrete example of how this plays out. So on the left, this is the Prius gas car. Its negative externality is about 9,800 bucks. On the right, this is the Rivian R1S. Its negative externality is almost, uh, almost three times bigger. So there's a gas car way over here, the Prius, and there's a Rivian way over here, the, <clears throat> there's a, that's three times worse. Which one are we subsidizing under the IRA? We're subsidizing the one that is much dirtier. So that is something that I think is a, just a really, it's kind of an obvious insight, of course, ex post. But this is one of the sort of generic policy design issues with homogeneous subsidies. We're subsidizing all of these EVs in red by $7,500. Despite the fact that some of these EVs are like really good for the world, and some of the, these EVs are really bad for the world relative to gas cars. Meanwhile, the Prius down here, we're not helping them at all. 
So this is one of the limitations of just sort of in a blunt way saying we're just going to subsidize EVs as opposed to differentiating between the different uh, harmfulness of the cars. Okay, great. So let me show you um, a little bit of information, a little bit of stuff about how the market has changed in response to the IRA. And I'll show you some modeling and then we'll conclude. So I told you I have this great data from, the, from uh, Cox Automotive, the company that does the computer systems at the dealerships. So let me show you what's happening to the prices of leased vehicles. And again, there's two things. Uh, so let me just remind you of the setup. So starting January 1st of 23 of last year, the IRA Section 45W tax credits were available to lessors. So in other words, like um, the leasing companies, all the Kias and the Teslas and anybody uh, who was leasing an EV to people, they could get a $7,500 tax credit um, for that lease. The key question is what's happening to the prices that they're charging uh, under those leases? Because one option is, you know, Tesla gets the $7,500 tax credit and they keep prices the same. And so they just pocket the money. Another option is Tesla gets the $7,500 tax credit and immediately they pass that through to consumers. And so it's consumers that are benefiting. So when we talk about economic incidents or pass through, we're asking basically who is getting the benefit of these, um, these tax credits, the so-called statutory incidence of them is on the, um, is on the firms. In other words, the firm is the one that's collecting the money from the IRS, the leasing company. But the real question is how much of that is like resulting in actual benefits to consumers. So that's what we want to ask here. The only way we can do this is with the Cox data, because that's the only data set that actually has the details of the lease terms to, to actually look at. So what I'm going to do is, for every model, I'm going to construct a variable called the relative lease price, which is just the, um, it's basically the, the, the total lease payments plus the residual for leasing the car. So like if you paid $1,000 a month for, sorry, if you paid $500 a month for 36 months, that's, uh, that's $18,000. That's your lease payment over the term of the lease. Then there's a residual, like what, it's, what the resale price of the car is worth after that. And we'd add that on on top. And that lease payments plus residual is basically comparable to the purchase price of a vehicle that you might sell to somebody else. So we're going to construct this, this lease price variable and subtract off the average purchase price for, for, uh, for the same model uh, in the same month. So basically have a, have, a, have a variable that tells us how the lease price of a vehicle is changing relative to the average purchase price of that same vehicle at the same time. Let me show you this first for gas vehicles. So this is, again, my relative lease price variable. So averaging across all gas vehicle models, um, what is the lease price of that model minus the purchase price of that model? It's pretty close to zero. So it turns out leases in our calculation are a little bit cheaper than, than purchases. Um, so this sits at about negative three or $4,000. And this is looking over a period from January 22, IRA is passed here in August of 22 and looking through the end of last year. So the market softens in late 22. So if any, I don't know if anybody tried to buy a uh, car in 2022. I did actually. You basically couldn't find a car here. Uh, but by 23, interest rates are higher, demand is softening, and so the whole market is softening. It turns out that um, car companies, when the market softens, they want to lease more for a variety of reasons. And so they try to, they, they, they offer better deals on leases relative to the, uh, what they're charging for cars if you buy the car. So if you're ever, by the way, that's a word to the wise. If you're ever buy, if you're ever looking for a car in a declining market, look for leases that are gonna be better deals there. So that's why this gray line for gas cars decreases a little bit over time is because the, the, the all the car companies are seeing the market soften and they're offering better deals on leases. This wasn't the question. This is just a control looking at gas cars. The real question is what's happening to electric cars? 
um, over this period. So I wanna focus um, uh, on this group in red. This is a group of vehicles that I'm calling excluded August 22. What I mean by that is, these are the vehicle, these are the models that actually the day the IRA passed were no longer available for the standard uh, purchase tax credits under the so-called Section 30D. So they had been receiving, so this is all the foreign assembled vehicles, basically. This is Kia, Hyundai, some of the BMW, Mercedes, et cetera. They had been um, eligible for $7,500 purchase tax credits. And then immediately starting in, um, in August of 22, they're no longer eligible for those. In January of 23, that's when this new Section 45W uh, tax credit to the lessor takes effect. So all of these folks are now seeing that suddenly as of January, they can pocket another 7,500 bucks if they lease cars. And so again, the uh, lease EVs. So again, the question is, are they passing that through to consumers in the form of lower lease prices or are they just keeping it for themselves? And the answer is, as you can see, lease prices go way down for these Hondas, Kias, BMWs, et cetera, um, over the months uh, of 2023, and even and much more so than the gasoline vehicles, which I've kept in, um, in, in the gray here. So this is saying that actually the benefit of these tax credits to, uh, that are paid to lessors is actually being passed through to consumers who are leasing the cars. So that's an important part of the market trend. Then you can say, well, what's happening to the, uh, are people actually leasing more? And the answer is uh, yes. So this is looking at the lease, sh the share of vehicles that are leased as opposed to sold. For gasoline vehicles, it's right around 20% over this whole period. For this excluded August 2022 group, it's going from 20% leases to 60% leases by the end of uh, 2023. And so this, the market is responding actually significantly to the IRA leasing tax credits here. So that's kind of an example of the market trends. And this is useful because, A, because now we have a better understanding of what the IRA was doing, but B, it's gonna give us, um, we're gonna actually use these trends to help calibrate part of our discrete choice model because the extent to which people are willing to switch between purchasing and leasing is gonna be a, a, basically a substitution parameter that we're, we're gonna to wanna to capture in our discrete choice. Let me pause for a second. I'm gonna give you about a in, a, in a moment I'm gonna give you about a five minute overview of our, of our discrete choice model and then I'm gonna stop. But before I do that, did anybody have any questions on kind of where we're at so far? Yeah. Could you just explain again what excluded August 2022 means for the red? Yeah, state? sorry to be unclear. So this is under the IRA, or sorry, even before the IRA, there was the $7,500 clean vehicle credit. Um, the IRA changed that in various ways. One of them was immediately starting August 22 after the IRA was passed. They excluded from the credit all vehicles that were assembled outside of North America. So this is Kia, Hyundai, Mercedes, BMW, a variety of other cars. So those cars were immediately excluded. And so I'm sort of collecting them all together in this red group. It's basically, think of it as just foreign cars. So cars that is outside of like non-American manufacturers, like, like Kia is a Korean company? Yeah, I mean, technically it is about where the car is assembled. So there's there are actually some American manufacturers that may be assembling abroad and vice versa. Yeah. Any other questions about this? Yeah, in the back. Why did you pull out Tesla and GM? Uh, so Tesla and GM, well, in this link the presentation, I didn't get to the detail of why, but basically the reason is these three groups are groups that are affected at different times by the IRA changes. So Tesla and GM, the reason that they're separate is we have another part of the paper where um, we look at what, what happens to them. And those two are connected because um, under ARA, the, the, under the Recovery Act of 2009, the previous electric vehicle tax credits, that had a phase out. So Tesla and GM had both lost their eligibility 
for the $7,500 credits under the Recovery Act, and the IRA restored them. So that's like another type of event study that we can do that I don't have time to do today. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to clarify that the vertical gray dotted line is when you can lease an EV um, that's assembled abroad. Is that correct? In January. This is the line. This is the point at which the the manufacturer can get a credit, a tax credit for leasing any vehicle, including those that are assembled abroad. So before that, if it was a similar body, you could not, or the, the manufacturer could not get the rebate. Uh, in this period, immediately before, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Has your group uh, looked at the externality differences between leasing and purchasing a vehicle? Um, by our calculation, like, if the car's driven the same amount in the same place, then that's what matters. It's like where it's driven and how much it's driven. And so if I lease the car or bought the car, it would generate the same externality. I think what you're asking is, do people who lease, uh, are they using the car in a different place or are they using it by a different amount? Yeah. Um, I do, we have not looked at that. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Why do the other EVs show an increase in lease share and drop in lease price if they were still eligible for the 7,500? The that is one of the interesting questions here that I don't think we have a great answer to. So these other EVs, as you say, under Section 30D, they had been um, eligible. The lessor could, could, could claim a tax credit. I think uh, what our conversations have suggested, I think, two possible reasons. Um, one of, I, honestly, I don't know. Um, one of the reasons that was suggested to us was that something about the IRA changed the equilibrium in the leasing market. It kind of used to be that nobody knew about that um, leasing tax credit that was available to the manufacturers. And so maybe consumers weren't pushing to get it passed through. And then suddenly what happened in January of last year was that a bunch of companies were very prominently advertising $7,500 lease cash. And it could be that like something about the overall market, market equilibrium changed. And so the EV buyer started saying, well, wait, where's my lease cash? I want to get that now. That's the best I can do. Yeah, it's interesting. Totally interesting. Yeah, thanks for flagging that. Okay, so let me tell you briefly, just very briefly, um, about what we do here. Um, what we want to do is ask what would be the effects of alternative electric vehicle tax credit designs? So what if instead of the IRA, well, like what if we changed the leasing loophole or what if we had uh, EV tax credits that were differentiated by how, uh, how harmful the vehicle is in terms of externalities or other things? For that, we need a model. Um, and so we're going to use a discrete choice model and a, and a framework that's pretty standard going back to a, a paper by Barry Levinson and Pegas from 1995, if any of you happen to know that framework. So uh, the short version of this is we're going to assume that um, all the manufacturers sell vehicles in a Bertrand and Nash equilibrium. So they set prices to maximize profits uh, in equilibrium. So their, best their prices are best responding to the vector of prices charged by all of the vehicles. So basically, automakers are, ma are maximizing profits. Um, the, on the demand side, we're actually going to do just a very relatively simple nested logit uh, demand system, um, which is basically going to look like this. Um, consumers decide, do they want an electric vehicle or a gasoline vehicle or maybe no vehicle at all? And these are going to be two different nests. And so we're going to have a flexible substitution pattern between EVs and GVs that is empirically calibrated using the second choice data I mentioned before. Then uh, within electric vehicles and gas vehicles, you choose the class of vehicle do you want. Do you want a sedan or a pickup or an SUV? Um, the substitution patterns between these things are also determined by the second choice data that I said before. So if you survey people who bought sedans, how many of them said that their second choice vehicle was also a sedan? 
I would say they have very tight preferences within a vehicle class versus they might have sedan buyers might have said, oh, if, if my Honda Accord weren't available, I would have bought a big old SUV instead. That would mean something very different for how we would predict that people would respond to things like you know subsidies for particular vehicles. Then within the class, I can choose to buy um, which I choose which specific model I want. EV number one, EV number two, blah, 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 the Rivian, the Tesla, blah, blah, blah. And then within that, I can buy or lease. And this substitution pattern is determined by like the willingness to substitute across between purchases and leases is um, going to be important for evaluating parts of the IRA, like the leasing loophole. This substitution pattern, this parameter in the model is also is pinned down by the figures that I was showing you before where the prices change and then like how much the market shares change. So all of this is pinned down by actual by actual market data. Um, let me just show you one thing that we do with this model and then I'll conclude. I think you know the big question here is going to be what would happen if we killed the electric vehicle tax credits? What would happen if a new administration and a new Congress says, you know, we're going to we're going to kill this part of the IRA? So this is what is in uh, the left bar. Just focus on the left bar, if you will. Um, this is comparing. This is a world where we get rid of the EV tax credits compared to a world, the current world with the IRA. This is the welfare change in units of billions of dollars per year in the new vehicle market. And welfare uh, is in dollar units and it's comprised of impacts on several different groups. There's government spending. So if we kill the IRA tax credits, the government saves a bunch of money. That's in orange, saving a bunch of money. Um, if we kill the tax credits, while well, you're subsidizing something that car makers are selling, and so when we kill those credits, the car makers lose profits. So the U.S. producer surplus goes down. That's why um, this, green variable, uh, this green area is negative. And this is just for the U.S. manufacturers. The foreign manufacturers, what happens to them? Well, actually, foreign manufacturers would benefit if we killed the IRA. Killed the IRA. And that's because the IRA is differentially subsidizing American-made vehicles. And so it's actually the, the, the if if the current administration the incoming administration has said we're not fans of these tax credits, getting rid of those will harm U.S. producers and will benefit foreign producers. Finally, uh, consumer surplus, you get rid of a subsidy for electric vehicles that is reducing the effective prices. That's going to be bad for consumers, and the externalities. Um, Stop subsidizing EVs and externalities will go up. People will go back to gas vehicles and those are more polluting. So overall, the net impact of killing the IRA EV subsidies would be a reduction in total like global well-being of about a billion dollars um, per year. That's the sort of thing we can do with this analysis. So um, with that, I will stop. And we can open up for questions, or there's more that we can talk about with the used electric vehicle tax credits. But at a high level, um, what I love about this kind of work is that we're getting new data. We're getting a sense of how markets are changing using, well, I just showed you some figures, and that goes into some regression analyses, and there's you know more you know, complex stuff we can do. But then we have this model and say, like, we can use this to simulate different policies, different alternatives that policymakers have, and use that to inform uh, a policy discussion. So that's I'm excited to uh, be doing this work with these great co-authors, and I'm excited for your questions. In your previous slide where you had the nested chart, have you looked at whether the first choice is whether people want to buy or lease? instead of first deciding if they want to in their GV? Yeah, the, the ordering of this is consequential, but in maybe a different way than people might intuit. It's not the ordering of like what's up top versus lower down is not intended to correspond to like the order in which you make decisions. 
it's actually a more technical reason having to do with like the relative magnitudes of the substitution patterns of the of the parameters have to be in a particular order. So the it could be that you come in and you actually, just, as you say, decide first, oh, I'd like to lease or buy, and that's the first decision you make. Uh, and that's totally okay in this model. It's not about the order of choices. There's a more subtle issue, which you're also right about, which is like, if we do reorder these, that, that could change a few things, but um, that's a more subtle issue. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, Doffer. In the last bar chart, could you explain uh, what was on the right bar, the slide after this? Yeah, yeah, so, this is this left bar was what if you re-simulate 2023 except with no EV tax credits. The right bar is a little different. It is what if you re-simulate 2023 um, as it would have been had the IRA not passed in the first place. That's a different question. This is a little more relevant to like what's going to happen going forward as long as we don't have too many new cars models introduced. Re-simulate 2023 with no tax credits. The pre-IRA status quo was different from no tax credits. That was, as we actually were talking about before, um, under the Recovery Act, there was that phase out after a given OEM, after a given automaker had sold 200,000 um, electric vehicles, they were no longer eligible to receive uh, tax credits. So it turned out that by 2023, the OEMs that had lost eligibility were Tesla and GM, as we talked about. But then there were a couple of others that were about to get there. Uh, I, uh, and they were, pre they were the um, additional big three. It was uh, Stellantis, Ford, and then I think Toyota was about to get there as well. And so, but the setting aside the exact company names, what, what is clear in, uh, is that it was the American automakers that had hit their 200,000 uh, vehicle cap. And so a big thing that the IRA did was just restore tax credits to the American automakers. Um, and this reflects that. So if you compare the IRA to the pre-IRA status quo, the um, what would have happened is like is worse overall. Um, and a much larger hit to the American automakers' profits and a much bigger benefit to the foreign automakers because the foreign automakers were still eligible. Some of them were still eligible for the tax credit. So that's what the difference is here. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yeah. Um, so obviously excluding non-North American vehicles is like kind of a tariff, but tariffs are obviously part of the discussion today. Yeah. I'm curious, like if you've modeled out some of those impacts or... Yeah, could just discuss it. I mean, the the there's a there's there's a two part answer to that question. So, in this this is what you would call a static or short run model. It basically says like let's take for granted the set of vehicle uh, makes and models that are available and their production costs, and let's just simulate what the market would look like in different settings. And so. You know, you might then say, well, what if you added BYD to the choice set? So they make really good and really cheap electric vehicles. When I say really good, I mean very popular in other countries where they're sold and competing against other cars, as you, I think, know well. So if you were to add those to the choice set in the short run, you just get a huge env environmental benefit, right? You'd get a lot more people buying, you'd probably get a lot more people buying EVs, and that would be good for externalities. Um, would reduce pollution. So that's kind of the standard answer. Then the question is, of course, like what are we getting for our industry and our workers when we protect a nascent domestic industry? And I think the standard answer under the Washington consensus was don't protect domestic nascent industries. And just like if somebody else wants to make it for cheaper and better, like great. And of course, the IRA is part of a global rethink of that. And the question is, well, maybe if we protect our EV manufacturers from, a, from tough foreign competition, in the longer run, that'll pay off. I think in some countries, there's, 
it seems to be that that's worn out, and in other cases, it's it's just tough to say. <coughs> but I think that's a long way of saying I think we know what the forces are, and it's really hard to actually model. Yeah. I saw you first, yeah. Maybe a related question. I always had this impression that the goal here was to try to get EVs to the point where they were less expensive to manufacture than IC cars, so that therefore the natural sort of the natural demand would pick up based on lower prices and sort of people buying them because they were cheaper. Is there kind of a preference between these two approaches, the pre-IRA and the IRA approach that would also would enable American manufacturers to get to a more cost-effective, lower cost? bill of materials and sale price, at which point you don't really need incentives per se to yeah. manufacturer's behavior. Yeah, I think, I think you're hitting on a, like a, a, a really strong intuition, which is just like, we want to figure out how long we have to protect an industry for until we can like let it compete globally. And I think that was actually probably part of the original logic under the Recovery Act where they said, oh, let's like subsidize the first 200,000 EVs made by each manufacturer. After then, we'll let them, you know, we'll let them compete. Um, I think the answer to your question is just totally unknown, but let me, let me flag what I think is a part of the question that is, that is maybe not sufficiently appreciated, which is it matters whether the productivity gains are internalized by the by the manufacturer versus spill over to other companies, right? So think about Tesla. What did they do? They lost a bunch of money over a bunch of years um, because they had confidence that eventually they were going to learn how to produce EVs better and they were right. That's not something the government necessarily needs to subsidize. That's one company losing money in the short run to benefit in the long run from learning how to manufacture stuff better. There's no externality there. There's no cause for, in a sort of standard economic setup, there's no cause for government, there's no market failure. Where there is a market failure is when Tesla learns how to do stuff and then other companies realize, oh, maybe I can do this too. And then all the Tesla execs quit and go to Redwood Materials or go to like whatever. And all the work that that company did then benefits the rest of the industry in a way that doesn't benefit the investors of Tesla. So I think the real question that is totally open for research uh, and very hard is not like what is the learning curve within a company, but what is the spillover? What are the gains from innovation that do not accrue to the innovator, but accrue to other companies? That is central to like this discussion and basically all of the industrial policy discussions that we're having today. And I don't think we know the answer. Thank you very much. Let's thank Hunt.